Leo received his undergrad degree from RPI in physics in 1988 and got a PhD in physics from Harvard under David Nelson in 1993. Uh, his work has focused on a range of problems in condensed matter physics, some in what's called soft condensed matter physics, in crystals, colloids, and membranes, and also some in, in the subfield of hard condensed matter physics, studying superconductors and quantum Hall systems. His work has been unified by a deep insight into the striking and surprising sort of collective emergent universal behaviors that come out of strongly coupled systems uh, at long distances and low energies. Who is he talking about? Uh, Leo's achievements have not escaped the notice of, of panels that award uh, awards to young physicists. Uh, he's been named a Sloan Fellow by the A.P. Sloan Foundation, a David and Lucille Packard Fellow in Science and Engineering, and most recently he received the Simon's Investigator Award in the Mathematical and Physical Sciences. So I look forward to hearing his talk. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Shaman. Thanks for the uh, invitation to speak here, and it's a pleasure to be back at Stanford, where I can um, not only reconnect with old friends and colleagues, but also check on my kids, make sure that they're having fun and not just uh, studying all the time. And what's the answer? They're having fun. My son just turned 21, so they, uh, he had, a, uh, had some fun in the city uh, just two days ago. Anyway, so what I want to tell you about is some work that we've been doing on new type of quantum liquids. And these quantum liquids exhibit something that we call quantum uh, fracton order, hence this funny word fractonicity that I will explain. That's the subject of the talk. And even more remarkably, uh, there's a, the uh, message of the talk will be a connection of this very somewhat sophisticated esoteric subject in quantum liquids, new type of quantum liquids, to something seemingly quite mundane, namely qu quantum crystals and elasticity theory, and, and in particular topological defects in, in these crystals. So my goal is to explain these ideas. Um, but before I do that, because this is a colloquium, I want to put this in a broader perspective, so let me you know, assuming that it's not just a condensed matter audience here, uh, let me pontificate a bit about sort of states of condensed matter uh, that my, my, many of us are occupied in studying. And so um, when we first get introduced, let's say in high school, to the states of matter, this is kind of a new phase diagram that we see, it's somewhat boring about, it tells us about crystals, liquids, and gases, and there's various kind of white lies that are in, in this uh, image, but you know, when you begin to study condensed matter physics and actually just look around in the world around you, we realize that actually the world of matter is, looks more like this, and even in this is just the tip of the iceberg. And it, you know, the kind of things that we study is, you know, ranges from systems like semiconductors, superconductors, magnets, uh, metals and insulators, all the way to, this is what we call hard condensed matter physics, all the way to soft matter like rubber, liquid crystals, granular materials. And kind of the unifying principles to these, to these systems is the really two ingredients that is responsible for this richness. It's the macroscopic number of degrees of freedom that are strongly interacting. Once you have that, you have condensed matter system. It doesn't matter what those degrees of freedom are, or what those uh, elementary units are, as long as you have a macroscopic number and they're strongly interacting, namely you have something like a liquid of some sort, then you will have a richness that we see in the world around us. And you know, in a bit more detail, uh, uh, so this, this richness, was of course was anticipated, and uh, and I guess so. I already mentioned what's at the heart of it is this strong interaction of macroscopic number degrees of freedom. But what's remarkable is that out of this richness and complexity uh, emerges universality and simplicity, and something that goes under the name of effective field theory. Uh, so when you look at low energies, long wavelengths, uh, at, at these complicated systems, what emerges is very simple, simple and universal behavior, and I've kind of listed a whole range of systems that are familiar uh, that where this emergence appears and the simplicity and universality emerges all the way from Navier-Stokes equations of a fluid to elasticity of crystals and down to thermodynamics critical phenomena, even Einstein gravity, you can think of this as the effective low energy, long wavelength theories of something mu that's much more complex at the microscopic level. So, so the way we understand phases of matter is in terms of 
almost all phases of matter we understand in terms of this lambda paradigm, uh, and this is the what I will call conventional phases of matter that obey this lambda paradigm. Typically, there's an order parameter that characterizes the, or distinguishes the ordered phase from your disordered phase, and then the different phases of matter are classified by different patterns of spontaneous symmetry breaking, so-called G mod H, like coset space uh, characterization. In these phases, these conventional phases that most of matter is, is in the, in the uh, modern parlance, have a short range entanglement. Basically, the very uh, many body wave function of characterizing those states is basically a product state uh, characterized by this order parameter. Okay, so this is kind of, for most of the things that we study, things like most of condensed matter physics and most things that realize in nature, antiferromagnet, charge density rate, superfluid, liquid crystals, and a slew of other phases, at least bosonic phases, are well characterized by this lambda paradigm. However, for the past couple of decades, uh, the field has really focused on something that goes beyond the lambda paradigm, something that we call states beyond symmetry breaking. And in part, this was motivated by anomalies that one sees in the you know, in uh, various superconductors, in particular high temperature superconductors that e exhibited a variety of anomalies that people are trying to understand uh, to try and, and, and therefore it motivated to go beyond this uh, Landau paradigm. So, uh, another example is the so-called fractional quantum Hall effect, which I would say it's probably fair to say is the only, you know, well-established example that really uh, displays uh, physics that's beyond sort of conventional Landa paradigm. Uh, but even though there's this paucity of uh, experimental realizations of beyond Landa paradigm, beyond symmetry breaking examples in experimental systems, the enormous progress has been made theoretically and now we know for sure there are well-defined theoretical models that you can solve exactly, at least they have exactly solved a point and that point is actually stable to perturbations where we can exactly solve it and can demonstrate that there's these quantum liquid ground states that are non-trivial but nevertheless are not described by any order parameter. So these are topological states of matter and so they occur in frustrated magnet-like models like spin ice but the kind of the simplest one is so-called toric code and I don't want to get into details of these uh, models but just to say just more describe uh, their properties and you know what, what properties come out and what they exhibit is is non-local excitations so when you flip when you do something locally these models exhibit non-local fractionalized excitations and these excitations appear at the ends of strings so like for example here in this model when you violate one of these terms this vertex term what appears is the uh, are the two electric charges that are connected by so-called electric field line or the analog of electric field line. Or if you violate a plaquette term, you get two magnetic charges connected again by a string, magnetic field line string. And these particles are anionic, they have non-trivial st uh, mutual statistics. Uh, these models exhibit top, if, they're, if you consider that model on a non-trivial manifold with a non-zero non, non genus, you will get, they exhibit topological order, that's a order one and they're a quantum many body wave function is long range entangled. And all these models, there's really a slew of these models, they, when they're in this topological phase, they are well described by gauge theories. That's kind of the unifying principle. And the way to give you some feeling for it is, uh, these gauge theories emerge from some kind of a microscopic model, the kind that I showed in the previous transparency. Uh, this is an example of a spin ice model, where there's some energetic local energetic penalty, uh, local energetic terms uh, that, uh, that constrain the system to be at low energies to be in the ground state, but then you can violate the constraint, and when you violate the constraint you create excitations, but those excitations have to be created in pairs, and when you're in this topological spin liquid state, uh, the, the line tension of the corresponding electric field line that connects these excitations loses its line tension so you get the ground state can be thought of as a Bose condensate of strings, closed strings and the excitations are broken strings 
And the excitations appear at the ends of broken strings, as illustrated here. This is something when called string, bo string condensate. And so the, what's important is to get into that phase, that string normally, you know, that, you know, if you have something that's connected by a string, like electric field line, pseudo electric field line, if that field line has a tension, then there's going to be, you won't be able to separate, like quarks in the, in the hadrons, you won't be able to separate those quarks or those, those particles. And so you might as well, the correct description is in terms of confinement. But, but the point is these charges, these uh, fractionalized charges can get deconfined when you lose line, when these uh, field lines lose tension. And what emerges at long energies and long scale, low energies and long scales, is really some kind of an emergent magnetism that's, a long wavelength to low energy description of this, for example, the spin ice magnet. Okay, so this is what the field has been focused on, and it's fair to say that everything, you know, all, all the spin liquids that we have studied are kind of follow this paradigm where there's some kind of a condensate of strings, closed strings, and excitations are fractionalized, they have non trivial statistics, and they appear at the ends of these open strings. Okay, but so with that introduction, now let me move on to the subject that I want to discuss, namely this new type of quantum liquid, which does not obey, you know, deviates qualitatively from this kind of, uh, this, these kind of quantum liquids, and this is the, and in particular it exhibits particles that are called fractons, and just kind of uh, jump to the punchline, these fractons are excitations that actually, by themselves, they're completely immobile. You can, you can create them anywhere in a sample, but when you create the, or in, the, in your model, and the model is translation invariant, but once you've created it, it cannot move by itself. So that's uh, a fascinating example of, uh, of, of fractal behavior that I will talk about. And what's really gonna be the punchline is that the somewhat sophisticated and really complicated looking models are related to something very, very simple, namely crystals, quantum crystals. And that's sort of my contribution to the subject. Uh, so what, what I'm gonna tell you about is symmetric tensor gauge theory formulation of fractons. And then uh, I'm gonna tell you about elasticity and the punchline will be that these complicated scary looking sounding tensor gauge theories are actually related to elasticity or more in more detail to topological defects in the crystal and namely uh, fractal elasticity duality. So that's kind of cool relating something that's complicated to something that's simple and familiar and deriving insights for, for, for both sides. So if we get here I'll be very happy but there'll be some icing in the cake for uh, a couple other things. There's, there's sort of another formulation of fractons, not in terms of tensor gauge theories, but in terms of vector gauge theories, which are much more familiar and much more sort of, we have much more intuition for them. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about symmetry in rich fractons from super solid phases, and then melting into super hexatic. So let's begin. So, so again, so the fractons, kind of simplest models of fractons are very much like the toric code-like models that I mentioned. It's a bunch of, w one type of fractons, we call them Z2 fractons. It's a fully gapped phases of matter, which consist of Hamiltonians that have terms that are made up of spins sitting on bonds of some lattice, for example, a cubic lattice like this. And the terms are, I don't want to put them in small print on purpose, so, because I don't want to get into these details, but basically a Hamiltonian is a sum of four terms. And the key point about those four terms is they're commuting. So therefore you can minimize the Hamiltonian, you can find the ground state by minimizing each term independently. So the, the, each of these terms is made up of non-commuting pieces, but the product of those pieces, namely that gives you these four terms, are commuting. So you can just, you understand completely that you can completely solve for the ground state of the way of, the, of this Hamiltonian. So this is, for example, it's called the next cube model. So the history is quite long. In fact, the first model of this type goes back to Chamon in 2005, Claudio was trying to find a way to get glassy behavior in a translationally invariant system. He wanted to construct a glass in a lattice model where there's complete translational invariance. So that's never been done and he came up with this amazing model. At that point, nobody knew about fractons and people didn't appreciate all the interesting properties of that Chamon model. But then the, uh, there was a renaissance in the subject and probably a renaissance came with this paper by Ha in 2011 and another one in 2013. Ha was a student at Caltech uh, and he was a quantum information person and he was motivated to, to construct quantum liquid models, uh, gap models in which excitations don't move, 
And so therefore, and, and he was motivated by having a quantum, robust quantum memory. So the idea is that somehow you're going to encode information, memory in the, in the configuration of these particles that can't move. And it'll, it'll be robust to quantum fluctuations. Okay, so that was the motivation. So there's, now there's an explosion of models, and I don't want to go into those, those models because my angle on it will be, and, and the message today will be quite different, somewhat orthogonal to this, but this is sort of the background. And, but let me again tell you what the, what the key properties are, which I've already mentioned. They still have non-local excitations. Uh, those excitations are fractionalized excitations, means you can't create one locally. You have to create them in some cluster. And so, but the key observation is, unlike the usual quantum liquids that are described by gauge theory, the standard ones, these guys have restricted mobility. Uh, so may, meaning individual particles, once you create them, you can't move them. You can move pairs, you can move four of them, or some combination, some cluster of them, but individually they cannot move. And my, my job will be to explain to you how that emerges in a very simple way. Uh, they, so it's believed that these models ha, are beyond topological quantum field theory description and gauge theory description that we, we heard about, at least conventional one. So again, the idea is here's the example in this model, just to go back to it for a second. So you know, I have a bunch of spins on the lattice. I flip a spin, and when I flip a spin, so the system is in the ground state. And the ground state is complicated, but we understand it exactly. But then I do something locally, I flip a spin. When I flip a spin, that flip of a spin generates not one excitation, not two excitations, but excitations that appear at the corners of some extended object. So for example, do you see these red bonds? So I flipped all these red bonds, and what I've created is four purple excitations. So if I, if I go back a little bit, few step back, if I flip only one bond, spin on only the red bond, one red bond, I would create four corners. So those are the four corners appearing at the corners of a membrane. But now I keep flipping spins, and those guys can separate, but they cannot move individually. So now in this model, there's just no local way to move one corner. You can move a pair of corners, you can move all four of them in a coordinate way. There's just no local operator that moves one by, by flipping spins. And that's why they're immobile. So again, so these are fractons, so fractons cannot move. So corners have extended objects. We call them fractons, they're immobile. You can, you can try to move it, but when you're forced to move it, if you add energy to the system, you create three more fractons. So you can think of this process as adding four anti-fractons, if you wish. If it's a Z2 model, it's the same thing as adding four fractons. So one of them will annihilate this guy and it will create three. But because these are gapped excitations, it costs energy, so you can't do it. It's an offshore process. There's also other excitations that can move, but they have restricted mobility. There are plane on particles that can only move in the plane, even though you have a three-dimensional system. Or there's line on particles that can move only along lines, and they cannot turn. Once you start them on the line, that's all they can do. Okay, so that's the phenomenology, basic phenomenology of these lattice Z2 models. But I'm going to tell you about something different. So in fact, uh, there's now many, many constructions starting with a simpler models, putting them together, and generating fracton models that we study and try to understand, properties of which we try to understand. But rather than telling you about these, each one of these can take an hour of a colloquium. What I want to tell you about is some very, one particular way of realizing fractons. These are called U1 gapless fracton phases. So this is called higher rank tensor gauge theories. And that's, my, that's the subject of the talk. So if you don't understand this, that's OK. That's, the, that's what I want to explain. OK. So, um, so the idea is that these type of fractons are going to be described in terms of effective electrical magnetic field theory. But the electric and magnetic fields are not going to be vectors like they are in ordinary electromagnetism or like in these spin liquids. They're going to be tensor fields. In the simplest realization, they're just a rank two tensor, so they have two indices. So it's not surprising that, you know, simplest model you can write down like this if you're kind of dreaming and trying to write down something we call scalar charge theory, meaning unlike ordinary Gauss's law where you have a single divergence, on the vector field, because there are two indices to saturate. You'll take double divergence on both indices, and the right-hand side will be the fracton density. Okay, so that's kind of the simplest real, uh, kind of a generalization of electromagnetism, where now your tensor electric gauge field, electric field, is the Gauss's law is generalized to be this double divergence. 
And it's amazing, but this simple property, as was first noted by Michael Pretko, is enough to give you fractons. And, and I'm going to explain that now. So here's your Gauss's law. And so Gauss's law, just like an ordinary Gauss's law, has charge conservation. So let's recall how that goes. If I take charge density, the right-hand side of this equation, and I integrate over all space, so let me focus on two spatial dimensions uh, for a while, then that charge is conserved because this rho is a divergence of the field, and so then you can integrate by parts, and the only way then you can change it is at the boundary. So locally, you cannot change the charge. Okay, and that's the usual case, and that's why, you know, that's the embodiment of charge conservation. But because this is a double divergence, you actually have not only charge conservation, but you also have dipole conservation. So rho times x, where x is a vector locating your charge, that guy can be integrated twice by, you know, you replace rho by this Gauss's law in terms of electric field, they integrate by parts twice, there are two derivatives, it's still a boundary term, so now the dipole is conserved. So now it's from this, this is enough to give you fractal behavior. But before I do that, let me just more carefully define what the tensor gauge theory is. It's a U1 symmetric tensor gauge theory, let's say in two plus one dimension. Electric, so you have electric field and you have magnetic field. Electric field is just a two, rank two symmetric tensor. You have a vector potential that's also a symmetric rank two tensor. They're canonically conjugate, just like in a harmonic oscillator. And B is like some kind of a funny curl of A, okay? You can put this model on the lattice and have a rotor model of it and study its uh, transitions, but this is the definition of what, what I mean, U1 symmetric tensor gauge theory. It's still E squared plus B squared like an ordinary magnetism. It's just it's made up of, it's a quantum theory, E and B, E and A don't commute, and they're, they're derived from a symmetric tensor gauge theory potential. So here's the Gauss's law we already saw, and so from this, from conservation of charge and dipoles, fractal phenomenology appears, so let me just run through that very quickly. So suppose I have a, a, a fracton here, I created it. You know, I've created maybe many of them, I want to move one of them, one side over. So if you think about it, if you motion of a charge corresponds to adding a dipole. You know, I destroy it here, I create it here, that's like addition of a dipole. But I'm not allowed to add a dipole, because dipoles are conserved and I had zero dipoles. So therefore, this process, if I want to do this, I have to also create anti-dipole to cancel that. And you know, if the, if the charges are, if dipole, if charges are gapped, then this is off-shell process and so this is forbidden. So then you get, so charges cannot move. That's really as simple as that. So it's kind of an incredible that in the continuum, you know, in, continu in this continuum theory, it embodies already at least one type of fractons. Of course, there are dipole, you can have dipoles, and those guys can move, and depending on details of the theory, some are restricted, have restricted mobility, and some do not. Okay, you know, Aaron's sitting here, and he's probably thinking, are there any realizations about this? I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of trouble because I won't know the answer to that question, but in some sense, this, there is a, that's kind of a where I've made a contribution to the subject. I, I'll say at least in principle there's a realization, and the realization of quantum crystals. And so what I'm going to tell you about is about elasticity in crystals, and then I'm going to make a statement about duality or relation of quantum crystals to this tensor gauge theory that I just defined. Okay? So, so so let me talk about topological defects in the crystal. So crystal has phonon excitation, sort of long, long wavelength, small, uh, small deformations of the crystal, but in addition it has topological defects. And there are two primary kinds. There are what's called disclinations, and for, for simplicity illustration, let me think about triangular lattice in 2D. Imagine cutting out a two pi over six wedge and gluing it together. So now you have a disclination where there's a site is five-fold rather than six-fold coordinated. So I had to do something very non-trivial. I had to cut out that wedge. Uh, so that's a disclination. In addition, you could have dislocations, and in fact, dislocations, okay, so you can have a seven, this is called a disclination that's five-fold coordinated. You can also add a wedge. So now you have a seven-fold coordinated disclinations. So this is kind of the opposite of this guy. But then if you have a dipole of these, it turns out, you have something that's called the dislocation. It's not so obvious it's a dipole of these two. But so dislocations is a vector topological defect. It's a place where a row of atoms ends. So it's a point where there's a singularity in this row of atoms. 
And what's amazing about dislocations is they have really hard time moving perpendicular to this Burgers vector, to this direction that defines this charge. And you can see, if I want to move this guy where it ends, over here, I have to get rid of an atom. I can't get rid of an atom, it's conserved. So if there are no holes in the system, this process is forbidden. So it's well known that dislocations cannot climb, but they can glide like this. They can move along B, but they cannot move perpendicular to B. And so in fact, this is what set me off, appreciating this property and not understanding these f complicated fracton models, but, think, but only noting the restricted mobility of their excitations, this picture came to mind. That there, I know that in a crystal, topological defects have this restricted mobility. So then, based on this and a variety of other checks, I, I put forth a, con, con, a, con, a conjecture that perhaps these guys are related to or embodiment of fractons. Okay? So if that's the case, then this would be fractons and and therefore, they better be immobile. These guys are like dipoles, and they can move, but in a restricted subdimensional way. But disclinations better, cannot, better not be able to move at all. And that claim, I've never heard in the literature, even though I work on elasticity, that disclinations are actually immobile. So then there must be, if this is to be true, you know, there's got to be a simple way, purely on the elasticity side, to understand why disclination cannot move. And so that's actually very simple to understand. One way to understand is, imagine, the way to think of a disclination is, is, a, is a basically a ray of dislocations that ends at a point. So it's a finite ray that ends at this point. It's very much like you can think of a charge as an infinite ray of dipoles. So the, the final guy is the charge. Okay, so it's just a construction to understand a, disc, a property disclination in terms of dislocation. So now imagine I try to move this point forward like this. Well, to do that, I have to extend it. I have to add one more dipole. Okay? But what does that dipole mean in terms of a crystal? Well, it means I have to add one more dislocation, which means I have to add a whole infinite array of atoms to this already array of dislocations. So I have to add a half row of atoms. So in terms of atoms, it's a non-local process. You know, there's no way I can have a, a you know, microscopic Hamiltonian that adds you know, Avogadro number of atoms to the system. Okay, so this is forbidden. There's no way to do this. There's no, you know, I can write it down by hand, like the, you know, if, if my elementary degrees of freedom were disclinations themselves, then of course I could do it. I could just write it down. But if my elementary degrees of freedom are spins, or in this case, atoms, in a crystal, then there's nothing I can write down that's local. It's completely forbidden by the structure. Another way to think of it is take a piece of paper, cut out a wedge out of it, and re-glue it and make a cone. The piece of paper, before you cut it out, is completely translation invariant. So it's your choice where you're going to end the, where you're going to place the cone on that piece of paper. But once you've glued it, there's no way to move that, that, that corner, that, that peak. Okay? So that's sort of a very, you know, at a very hand-waving level, but actually an accurate level, uh, understanding why disclinations cannot move. Okay, so now let me talk about elasticity just to put a little bit of equations there. Uh, I know it's a colloquium, but these are very simple. Uh, so let's, yeah. Um, pairs of disclinations can move. Right? Pairs of disclinations can move, and they move in exactly, they, but they move in a restricted way. They can glide, but they cannot climb. Right. Okay. So this will be the exact transition. Well, if they proliferate, but suppose I just create one, then I can study how it moves, and the claim will be these are the fractons, and these are the dipoles of fractons. Okay, so let me talk about a little bit about elasticity. You know, you have some regular lattice. It has a, it's a perfect lattice, but now you want to deform it. Well, there's some deformation U, which tells you how you deform a an atom that used to be a position capital R to a new position, so it's, it's some disordered state. So the object that plays a central role is not quite this U, but really a strain tensor, which is really a deviation of the metric from the preferred flat metric. And at linear order, it just looks like a derivative of U, which is symmetrized, DIUJ plus DJUI, okay? And this symmetrization is absolutely crucial. Uh, it, in fact, it encodes rotational invariance of the crystal. You can take the whole crystal and rotate it. So this symmetrization is really important. So then what's the Hamiltonian? Well, it's just a bunch of harmonic oscillators. There's kinetic energy term, momentum squared for every atom, 
for, you know, it's, this is momentum squared, and then there's a uij ukl squared, and this is just elastic constant. So in the simplest way, this is just, and this elastic constant, it's a tensor that encodes, it's just a constant that encodes the properties of crystal. And for different crystals, it's a different, types of, different type of tensor. But the object, the way you should really think of it is just p squared plus x squared. That's it. It's just harmonic, a bunch of harmonic oscillators. But it's quantum. These guys, pi and u, don't commute. Well, so now a little bit more mathematically, what's a disclination? If you define a bond angle theta, the way the bond points, then gradient of theta, normally you would think in the ordinary point where there's no disclination, curl of a gradient is zero. But if you have a disclination, then that disclination is singular, so curl of that grad theta will be non-zero. In fact, it will give you the dense, disc, density of disclinations, as indicated here. What is the dislocation in this language? You have a displacement u, gradient of that displacement u, if it was a single, in, in most points in the crystal where there are no singularities, curl of that gradient of u is zero. But if you have a dislocation, there'll be non-trivial curl of the gradient of u. Because u is not single value there. You go around and you don't come back to where you were. Okay, so that's, these are disclinations, dislocation. And of course, there's also vacancy in statisticals. If I think about a quantum system, I need to think about what these particles are doing. These are like empty sites. They're not topological, but I need to think about them as quantum degrees of freedom. Okay, so there again, so the conjecture I already stated, topological defects in the crystals are connected to the fractal quantum order. So now, okay, so that's the conjecture. Now the question is, can, you, can we demonstrate this in detail? I'm not gonna demonstrate it here, but I'm gonna give you a simplified version of it that's well known, uh, namely, it's another type of duality. It's called boson vortex duality, or duality between a superfluid and a, and the U1 gauge, vector gauge theory. So this is well known, goes back to these gentlemen and, and been studied to death for, for decades. So ordinary superfluid of just neutral bosonic atoms that both condense is at low energies described by a Goldstone mode, a phase of that super, uh, you know, superfluid wave function, if you wish. And a gradient of that phase is the current, is literally actually mass current of these bosons. And so, but in addition to the phase, which can vary smoothly, you could have points in your superfluid where you have vortices. And those vortices are quantized, they quantize circulation, but there are points where the curl of the gradient of phi, curl of j has non-zero, is non-zero. That's the vortex density, okay? And what's the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is just the kinetic energy, which is a grad phi squared, which is just j squared, and then the interaction of bosons n squared, okay? So it's just a simple Hamiltonian, uh, short range interaction between bosons, that's n squared, and plus j squared, okay, kinetic energy. And n and phi are canonically conjugate, like in a harmonic oscillator. Well, okay, so what does this have to do with the gauge theory? Well, imagine you rotate all these errors by 90 degrees. So you define a new vector E, which is rotated 90 degrees to J. You just can define that object. Then this law, then this picture becomes this picture. The vortex becomes just the charge. And this curl of J equals rho becomes divergence of E, this fake E equals to rho. And now, what is this Hamiltonian? Well, grad phi was j, but so rotated becomes e squared, and this guy becomes curl of a, which is b squared, and these guys are canonically conjugate, these guys are canonically conjugate, so you got a quantum electromagnetism. Okay, so it's very simple. So what you do for uh, elasticity, it's very similar. So if you look at this Hamiltonian, it's some gradient of the Goldstone mode phi. So that's very similar to uh, to kind of this theory, which is u is a gradient of, uij is a gradient of u, so it's squared, so it's kind of gradient of u squared plus kinetic energy. So the point is now we can take this Hamiltonian, and in fact I have it here, sorry. You can take the Lagrangian for that, so this is the elasticity squared, plus the kinetic energy, this is kinetic energy plus elastic energy, and now the condition for disclinicity is double curl of uij gives you disclination density, that's just this statement right here. These two statements can be written much more simply as double curl of uij gives you disclination density. This Lagrangian inside it has momentum conservation, not surprising. If you have a crystal, there's momentum conservation. So p dot 
plus gradient of the stress, sigma j, equals to zero. So it's just the Newton's law. But what's amazing now, just like for the simple case of the XY model, or for superfluid elect uh, vector electromagnetism duality, you can define el electrical magnetic fields which are perpendicular to these pi's, but basically proportional to these pi's. So if you introduce B, which is proportional to pi, rotated by 90 degrees, an electric field is proportional to sigma, this stress tensor, then this law just becomes Faraday law. So the momentum continuity, momentum conservation, Newton's law, is just in this language, is just Faraday's law for this magnetism. And the elasticity theory just becomes the electromagnetism, this tensor gauge theory that I talked about. And there's a usual gauge field that you can introduce to solve this, this Faraday's law. The way we do in electromagnetism, we have Faraday's law, we introduce vector potential, and that solves, that automatically solves that Faraday's law. And there's a gauge freedom that you can define. So anyway, so that's all summarized by this dictionary. So then uh, fracton in a tensor gauge theory is map onto disclinations. Dipoles, that these guys are immobile, disclinations are immobile. Dipoles can move, but they're subdimensional, they only move subdimensionally, and that's maps onto dislocations. Gauge modes are phonons. Electric fields map onto strains or stresses, which are proportional to each other. Magnetic field maps onto the lattice momentum. Faraday's law corresponds to the Newton's law. Okay? So that's, this is really the, really all I wanted to tell you, kind of as the the main core of the of this duality but now you know unless there are some questions I'll move on and tell you some more kind of embellishments and icing in the cakes on this basic s story yeah so um, imagine you just took this uh, introduction and go to higher rank tensors and then I could think of this in terms of a multipole expansion absolutely quadrupole conservation you know etc right is that uh, is that physically interesting? Or are there potential manifestations of that? that so most of the subject, unfortunately, is with the apologies to experimentalists, uh, is very theoretical. It's very new, and we're just trying to understand it. So already at this level, you know, I would say this is quite a, you know, quite a nice step towards experiments that we understand rank two tensor gauge theories. I have no idea how to realize rank three or rank four gauge theories. But in principle, one can imagine taking a model and imposing, and in fact, people play around now with model, take your favorite model of particles hopping in the lattice, and now you impose dipole conservation so they can only move like this, for example. So you impose dipole conservation. Or only, and then you impose on top quadruple conservation and so on. So then you'll get less and less realistic, but richer and richer models. So at some point, it becomes not as interesting just because it's more, you, you're getting further and further away from realizing it. So I don't know how to go beyond this. If you wish, this is the only case that's even remotely close to experiments where we can realize this is a crystal. So yeah. in the crystals, the uh, discriminations and dislocations have logarithmic like, forces binding them. That's right. But the fractons, they are free energetically that the energy cost is independent of the separation. <laughs> well, it, that's not, no, no. So, so there are two types of fracton theories. There are, these Z2 fully gapped ones, so then you create an excitation. There's no long range fields. Right. But then there's a U1 ones that are gapless. Their excitations indeed cost, you know, have long range fields associated with them. In the, in the crystal language, it's elastic fields. In the, in the gauge theory language, it's the electric and magnetic, electrostatic and magnetostatic energies. So, so they're different than the fully gapped ones, and indeed there are energy, there are these elastic energies that are there. But still you can disentangle, it, it, it's, what's true is that for these gapless ones, it's much more, it's more difficult to define sort of topological degeneracy and things that are very crisp in the gapped ones. And in particular, the excitations really have these additional long range fields coming along with them. But for example, suppose I consider a buckyball that guy, by topology, will have 12 disclinations. So I say that guy has 12 fractons in the ground state. And now this is a statement about how those fractons or disclinations, whether they're mobile or not mobile. So the statement is, if, you know, if I can connect to really experiments, I would say those pentagons, they really have, they can't move at all. They can't even make one step. 
They can't even move one lattice constant. So if, if you could create a buckyball where, for example, pentagons were not equally spaced, like un, unlike a soccer ball that Aaron has seen before, uh, you would think naively if they were really particles, you create them locally. You know, if you create them not equally spaced, you would think, well, at some point they will relax and, and go to an equally spaced one. My claim is at low enough temperatures, they will not be, no matter how much quantum fluctuates you have, they cannot move. So they'll, they'll be stuck in that frozen state. So that's kind of a theorist experiment, thought experiment of, of demonstrating this, okay? So now let me talk about some additional embellishments. So tensor gauge theories are actually, you know, are a bit counterintuitive. I'm not very familiar with them. You know, I don't have my, as much intuition. We don't have as much intuition. So it's much nicer to talk about vector gauge theories. So the, I've always had a question, even going back to the original conjecture, whether you can characterize this as a vector. You can just capture the same phenomenon using vector gauge theories. And the answer is yes. And I don't really have time to explain any detail except to, well, just give you some highlights. So the idea is that, um, uh, so, so what I worked on before, when I, when I, when, what I talked about before were tensor gauge theories where these guys were symmetric tensors. A and E were symmetric canonically conjugate tensors. But imagine I think of one of the, I, I consider an object where one of the indices, K, is the flavor and the other index is the vector index. So what this is, is really, what I'm going to consider is three vector gauge theories. There's going to be two vectors E sub K, and K can be A and B. So there's two capital E vector gauge theories, and there's one more little e vector gauge theory. Okay? So if they were not talking to each other, you just have three vector gauge theories. Two of these kind, A and B, and one of this kind, little e. Okay? And here's their Gauss's law. And they're canonically conjugate. Uh, the key way to couple them together to get fractons, so then you wouldn't have fractons, you just have two, three decoupled vector gauge theories. But to get fractons, what you do is, the divergence of this guy is the fracton density. But what's amazing is then, the components of this electric field are actually charges for this vector theory. So the components of this E, E sub A and E sub B appear as the right hand side of this Gauss's law. So fractal behavior appears immediately. Suppose I want to move this charge. When I move electric field charge, I create a little bit of electric field line. But, electric, but I'm not allowed to do that because that electric field line appears as a charge which is conserved in the second Gauss's law, in this Gauss's law. And so then I cannot, I cannot move it. So it's sort of so I came to this by reformulating elasticity in a certain way, and I don't really have time to describe it in detail, but this, this just emerged out of, you know, sort of detailed duality calculation. There's a lattice model, but so the way I like to think of it pictorially is like there are these two gauge theories, three gauge theories, well there's two gauge theories, E, A, and E, B, and then there's a third gauge theory that links them together, couples them together in this way. So these guys would fall apart if you get rid of the little e gauge theory, like let's say you confine it. And then you have two decoupled gauge theories and they don't have fractons. But this guy kind of glues them together in this non-trivial way. And there's a Hamiltonian, so there's a vector gauge theory of two types, E A and E B. There's a vector gauge theory little e. There's a fracton charges and dipole charges. And then they're coupled in this very funny way. Curl of little a, couples to capital A in this minimal like coupling. And there's a beautiful thing that uh, I'll say it immodestly, we have this higher form gauge theory formulation, reformulation of the kind of a principle that was inspired by this derivation of this Hamiltonian. Anyway, so it's a very nice, so this is the coupling, this is the linking of this little e of these, so these guys would be decoupled, but the curl of little a is actually not gauge invariant. And because it's not gauge invariant, it really needs an extra, it's a two form. Since A is a, already a one form, its curl is a two form, so it minimally couples to anti-symmetric part of this A, A, I, K. And so then uh, that's the linking that I'm drawing here pictorially. Okay, so that's one nugget that I wanted to add to the basic story. But now I want to tell you about something else. 
It's another, another sort of act, direction. So what I talked about is this tensor gauge theory that's dual to elasticity. So, that's, so here's this elasticity that I just discussed. Uh, strain tensor squared plus kinetic energy squared. Kinetic energy. But if I have a quantum theory of particles, let's say bosons, my atoms are bosons, I really have to describe what they're doing at zero temperature. Do they both condense? Are they remote insulating? And we know from just condensed matter physics studying quantum crystals, bosonic quantum crystals like helium, solid helium, that it actually has two forms, at least in principle. One form has never been found, but there's really two forms. One form in which vacancies in interstitials are mod insulating, so we call it a commensurate crystal, and the other form where you have vacancy in interstitials, meaning missing atoms, which have both condensed. That's called a super solid. So there's really two types of quantum crystals possible. And so I have to describe vacancies in interstitials, and the way I describe them is by a bosonic Hamiltonian, simple bosonic Hamiltonian that I already showed you. It's quantum XY model. Here's the repulsion, here's the kinetic energy. So I have these two pieces, elasticity part, and this is the bosonic part. And they're coupled by some terms, kinetic energy term, current current terms, and density density terms. But now, okay, so yeah, so this is what I already stated. There's a commensurate crystal where there are no vacancy interstitial. If they're, if they're there, they're mod insulating, they're gapped excitations. So that's a mod insulating crystal. And then there's an incommensurate crystal we call super solid, where vacancy interstitials are both condensed. And they have very different properties. In fact, this is going back to 1998 when I was studying vortex lattices and vortex super solids. With Christina Marchetti, we derived this uh, equation which says if you move a dislocation, you vi a dislocation motion appears on the right hand side of a current of a conservation of vacancy interstitial. So if you move a dislocation, if you move a dislocation, you'll, cr you'll have to create like a scar and you'll have to create vacancy interstitial. So a current of dislocation generates breakdown of vacancy interstitial. And that's just, this equation is just embodied, embodied in this picture. When you move a dislocation, if you allow it to climb, as opposed to glide, you'll generate vacancy interstitial. So if, uh, okay. So this is actually explains why you can't climb. If vacancy interstitials are gapped, like in this commensurate crystal. But if they both condense, then you begin to be able to move. If in a super solid, dislocations can both climb and glide. Because there's a condensate of, of bosonic atoms that you can eat up at, at will and eject at will into the condensate. Okay? So there's a different property of crystal. So now what you do is you just dualize. You dualize this part, which I already explained. You dualize this part, you get a vector gauge theory. From this you get tensor gauge theory. And then you get some coupling. So, okay, just for fun you do that. Here's the tensor gauge theory, here's the vector gauge theory, and then they're coupled together and they're coupled to the corresponding charges. And so then this predicts that a super solid is really a fracton, special kind of a fracton phase which break, has broken U1 symmetry. So here dipoles are mobile, fully mobile, and the normal modern slating crystal maps onto U1 conserving fracton phase. And so this is, we call it symmetry enriched fracton behavior in which in both disclinations cannot move, but the dipoles, dislocations, move in a very different way. In one case they're restricted, in the other case they're not restricted. And here I just explain how that happens and we study transitions between them. So, okay, so now another nugget. So if I take this tensor gauge theory and I look at it very much like an electromagnetism, you can study full electromagnetism, or ordinary electromagnetism, Everything is time dependent and fluctuating. But you can also just look at the electrostatic limit. You know, we teach students about electrostatic. So imagine I looked at the electrostatic limit of that tensor gauge theory that I derived. What do I get? And what I get is just what I used to call A0 or the scalar potential, that's the phi. I get this theory comes out from that tensor gauge theory. So there's a scalar potential phi. That's like the scale of potential. Usually this is Coulomb's law, so this guy is usually uh, a gradient of phi. But here it's a Laplacian of phi. My uh, pointer just died. Um, I don't know if I can point with anything. Okay, uh, Okay. well, I'm going to have to point with the finger. So first term is the Laplacian of phi, but then there's these two cosine terms. This is what's called the sine Gordon model. And this guy encodes disclinations of the charges and this guy encodes the dipoles of the charges. 
Uh, is there a pointer? Uh, you could probably use the cursor. Oh. Yeah. Do you have one? Okay, so, oh, thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks. <coughs> yeah, so you have this, you have this theory, and uh, you know, people study in statistical mechanics, we study tensor, uh, we study these kind of sign word models, and what's cool about this is, this is actually, as I'll show you in a second, it will reproduce famous uh, uh, Brzezinski, Castell, Stiles, Hopper, Nelson, Young theory, it's just a reformulation of it in terms of these, in terms of a sign word model. Okay, and the way to see that, so then what it predicts is there's a transition out of the fractan phase into a dipole condensate and then into the fractan condensate. And so the way to see this is, this is sort of the for stat mechanism aficionados a little bit. So if you look at this funny sine Gord model, you can show that this cosine is irrelevant when this GB is small. And so what appears is you can just throw this out. If GB is small, you can throw this out. But then it looks like a second derivative of phi squared plus a cosine of derivative of phi. That's this term. If you squint your eyes and ignore all the indices, this is d phi, cosine of d phi, and this is derivative of d phi squared. But now this sort of looks like co uh, ordinary sine Gord model, but in derivative of phi. But so that, that has a transition as a function of temperature. So here's this GS, that's this GS. It's irrelevant at low temperatures. And, and, but the GB can be irrelevant or relevant depending on the value of the temperature, uh, ratio of temperature to B. So then there's a costless towers like transition from here to here, and that's when this cosine becomes relevant. But once this cosine has become relevant, you can just replace it by its argument squared. And when you replace it by its argument squared, this cosine becomes this. Now you can ignore this term, and now you can restore this cosine. And now it becomes a uh, ordinary sine Gord model in the phi, which is a transition from the dipole condensate to a fractan condensate. So this is the two-stage transition from fractan phase to a dipole condensate phase to a fractan condensate. And that's the two-stage melting transition of a crystal, but in the sine Gord, vector sine Gord model language. Sorry, sorry, just to clarify. So this would be like the hexotic... Uh... This is, would be like the hexotic, and this would be like the isotropic liquid, exactly. Okay, so this is just much more intuitive way, to me at least, to understand, you know, all the physics in already, that's already done in this similar paper. But now you can do a quantum version of this, so, so there's a quantum model of the sensor, fully dynamical quantum theory of the sensor gauge theory, and in that theory you can unbind dislocations. So this is now quantum melting of this, of this crystal, or, or quantum uh, transition out of this fracton state, and where you go is to into a superhexatic. So you go to a hexatic phase, but a hexatic phase is actually a superhexatic, meaning it's superfluid necessarily. And the reason for that is because if you unbind dislocations, if you condense dislocations, two dislocations actually equal and opposite dislocations actually have the same symmetry as an atom. So you are required by symmetry in your Hamiltonian to have a term B dagger. B dagger, B dagger minus B A. So if these guys condense, then automatically atoms have to condense. So you go into hex hexatic phase in which atoms have both condensed as well. So it's a super hexatic or super fluid hexatic. And so then there's a phase diagram where you have a fractan phase with a U1 charge non-conserving, so dipoles are fully mobile. You have a commensurate crystal corresponding to a fractan phase where dipoles are have a sub-dimensional mobility. There's a superhexatic and there's a superfluid phase. Okay, so with that, let me just uh, summarize and close and thank you for your attention. So what I talked about is a new class of fractonic quantum liquids and they're kind of the most remarkable properties. They're, they have exhibit quasi-particles that have restricted mobility, so they're fully immobile. And they also have other type of excitations which are kind of dipoles and higher multiple particles which have restricted mobility, linons and planons. And then I described how this 
very somewhat esoteric state is actually embodied in a quantum crystal, and in particular topological typical crystal, uh, as summarized by this dictionary. And then I talked about possible ways of leaving that fracton phase, the simplest fracton phase, and going to adjacent phases and thinking about their properties. And then, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, things that we're doing now that some, uh, that are, you know, in the, prog in the process of finishing, some in the process of finishing. For example, I talked about melting a crystal that corresponds to leaving this fracton phase by condensing dis dislocations, namely doing this. But there's also another way to leave a, a crystal. You can condense one type of dislocation, but not the other. It's what we call anisotropic melting. So then you'll go from a crystal to what's called a smectic. Now you get a layered structure which is still periodic in this direction, but now it's a bunch of periodic array of liquids. So that's a quantum smectic. So there's a, you can dualize this guy and construct a fracton-like theory that describes a quantum, dual to quantum smectic. And, and there's various ways to get to it in this uh, kind of a cool thing. Then one thing I discovered that this subject is surprisingly related to something that computer scientists are very much interested in, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but it's something called connectivity editing in tessellated meshes. So, you know, people try to construct some kind of a mesh to describe a figure. Okay, I don't know, for animation, for example. And, you know, when they construct it, they'll create, topology requires, let's say it's a closed surface, requires 12 disclinations. But it will create many more disclinations as you try to create this triangulation of the surface. So then, these guys, computer scientists, come, you know, have very detailed studies of like, what are the rules for motion of disclinations, you know, they call them irregular vertices, in order to smooth out the surface, to get rid of the extra defect that you didn't have to create. And they have really like elaborate, you know, there's no like comprehensive theory, they just enumerate all the rules. And if you look at those rules, those rules are the fractonic rules. They're, they're you know, individual guys you cannot move, but some coordinated guys you can move. The only thing they don't have is the energy, so there's no issue of moving it if you create three other ones, so because there, there's no concept of energy they can create as many as they want. So anyway, so you, go, you want to go from here to here, and so this is this connectivity editing. And so in principle, in a way I still don't understand, I'm yet to understand, this theory of fractons, this tensor gauge theory, this captures the dynamics that you're allowed to take in order to go from this tessellation with extra defects to this guy. And then there's various other things that, I, uh, that we're thinking about that are listed here. So with this, I'll uh, close and thank you for your attention. Yeah, so it's hard to make comments about degeneracy in the gapless theory. It's very much like, you know, in a Tory code in a gapped Z2 spin liquids, you can talk about degen topological degeneracy, but once it's gapless, like in U1 vector gauge theories, there's, you know, there are gapless excitations, so you don't really, I don't know how to, how to define it in a, in a precise way. So the same story happens here. So think of this, tensor gauge theories, as U1 fractonic theories, while the other guys are Z2 gapped fractonic theories. So there we can define it here. We, I don't know how to define still it. there, all of the states, the whole tower of states, will still have the, the topological degeneracies. You can still do it for U1. You can still do it for, okay, I'm, I'm happy to hear, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear and talk to you more about it. But, but what I was going to ask is, as a consequence, is the degeneracy aspect not as important as the restriction? Are they as fundamental? Uh, you know, short answer is I don't know. You know, you know, if you wish, here's an example where Steve knows how to define, I don't know how to define uh, topological degeneracy in these gapless models, but it's very simple to encode in a field theory, at least at a Gaussian level, to encode uh, this restricted mobility. But somehow, there, there's a way to think of a U1 case as a limiting procedure of a ZN case where N goes to infinity. And so in that sense, as N becomes larger and larger, kind of the, in order to move, you have to move 
further and further. You, you, the operator that moves particles becomes more and more non-local. So maybe there's a way to approach it from that limiting procedure to understand it. Leo, do you have any comments on continuum descriptions of fraction phases? Well, this is sort of a continuum description, but I think it doesn't, well, so it doesn't capture, it doesn't capture all the properties. Uh, so for example, I, I don't know how to put it on the curved space. Can you get the, the fractional power growth with volume of ground state degeneracy in the continuum description? Well, so that's what I was talking about. So the I don't even know how to get any ground state degeneracy. But once it's uh, gapless, I don't really know how to define. I don't know if, uh, if Steve maybe has a comment on it. I, I don't know how to define. For like for U1, let's say we ask that question for U1 gauge theory. And we, and we consider it on the on a torus. But then the degeneracy doesn't grow. No, I understand. But can you notice that there's some degeneracy or there's some non-trivial? You know, Bisons are gap, it should be exponential uh, power law. And it should be at the whole tower of state. Okay, I see, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot we still don't understand. And, uh... Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Leo again.